So, have you got your Bibles? Do you have your Bibles with you? If you do, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to the Gospel of John. We're going to begin a new series in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John in the New Testament. And I may throw you a little bit of a curveball, but today is going to be an introduction to the Gospel of John. And so we're not going to turn to the first chapter and the first verse. We will start that next week. But I am going to have you turn actually with me to John chapter 20. And this will be our, our theme verse today in John chapter 20. And we will look at verses 30 and 31. So John, Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Many other signs, therefore, Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. John says the things that I have written, a lot of things I haven't even written. The Holy Spirit didn't prompt him to write many of the things in some of the other Gospels, but he said the things that had been written, there's a purpose for it. There's a reason for it. That you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. He is the Son of God. And in so believing that you may have life in his name. So John chapter 20 and verse 31 is our theme verse today. We're going to have an introduction to the book of John. I'm going to give you a lot of detail, a lot of information, but it's good so that we can kind of set the stage for uh, our study in the Gospel of John. With that said, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you for my brothers and sisters that are here. Lord, we've all come to worship you, and we thank you because we've worshiped in spirit and in truth, Lord. We've, uh, we've been able to just glorify you through corporate prayer, through corporate singing of hymns and praise songs through special song that's been sung lord even through things that we may think are mundane uh, such as announcements and things that are going on in the church but lord we worship you because we're a family and we need to be reminded and sometimes we are uh, not aware of things going on in our brothers and sisters lives and so we pray and we encourage we exhort one another we sing together we we, we love you, Lord. We intercede on behalf of one another. And now, Lord, we have uh, heard your word. We've heard these, these two verses read as an opportunity for an introduction to the Gospel of John. And Lord, I pray today that you would give us eyes to see, that you would give us ears to hear what your Holy Spirit would say to us today. And Heavenly Father, we will thank you and praise you for these things. We ask it. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said, amen. amen and amen. Perhaps just, just going to do this a cappello. Can we just worship the Lord? Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, just, and then we'll get into the text. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for And amen. So we're going to take time this morning to lay the foundation for our study in the Gospel of John by doing an introduction. And I'm going to give you as much information as I can. Um, of course, it is the Gospel of John because John the Apostle was the one that wrote it. It is unique from the other four Gospels. Maybe this would be a good way to begin. It's unique from the other four Gospels. And there, have, there are four Gospels. 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And uh, we might start and just maybe even just let's get more basic than that. Why do we have four Gospels, Pastor? Why don't, let's just have one Gospel. Why did God inspire four different people to write the Gospel accounts? And I like the way one, um, really from the first century or second century, one Christian writer put it. He said, there are not four Gospels, but one fourfold Gospel. You see, each of the Gospels offer a different perspective on the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. And we need all four to get the full picture. If we have one, that's wonderful. But if we have all four, and we do, then we get a fuller picture. Amen? So if, if you're trying to take the picture of, of the Grand Canyon or something else and you're just in one spot and you take that one picture, that's beautiful. There's grandeur. There's, it's just an incredible scene. But then if you can get the panorama, right, the full view all the way across and, get, and take everything in, it shows you that much more. And so it's not so much that there are four Gospels, there are, but it's the fourfold Gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, you say, how do we know that John is the author? Pretty simple. Um, the author is identified in, in this gospel, chapters 13, 19, 20, and 21, as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And you say, well, I thought he loved all of them. He did. But this was special code for John as he wrote because he didn't even really want to put his own name in. So he would always say, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And he loves, he, again, he loves all of them. But this was code for John. And we know that John wrote this gospel. It comes from a first-person perspective. It is one of the disciples that was with him. And we know from 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. We know from the book of the Revelation. All these are books that the apostle John wrote and then we have early church history to also back this assertion up so there is no question that the gospel of John actually was written not by John the Baptist now but by the apostle John and uh, this gospel was of course the last one to be written that's why it appears as fourth in our Bible um, probably written in the late 80s to the early 90s AD so John wrote all of his letters probably last in terms of uh, all the books of the New Testament. So he wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and then the Revelation was certainly the last uh, book that was written uh, in the first century. I don't think there's much uh, doubt about that. Now, there are significant events in the ministry of Jesus that Matthew, Mark, and Luke include, and John leaves out, including, right off the bat, we'll see when we get to chapter 1, that John doesn't mention what Matthew and Luke mention. What would that be? The birth of Jesus, right? They don't, they don't go into the details about the birth of Jesus. John doesn't go into detail about the baptism, the water baptism of Jesus, his temptation in the wilderness. Uh, doesn't give us as much detail on the Last Supper, um, uh, his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, the ascension, uh, many of the demonic confrontations, many of the parables that we read in the other three Gospels, we do not read in John's Gospel. The first three Gospels, by the way, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, center on Jesus' ministry in Galilee. But the Apostle John centers his Gospel on what Jesus said and did primarily in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. So this is another difference for us. All right, each of the Gospels emphasizes, as I said, a different aspect to Jesus. Maybe now would be a time to mention that to you if you haven't heard this before. Matthew shows that Jesus came from Abraham through David and demonstrates that he is the Messiah that has been promised in the Old Testament. So Matthew has a lot of Old Testament scriptures that he quotes to prove to his readers that Jesus is the fulfillment of all those Messianic prophecies. Mark shows us that Jesus came from Nazareth, and he demonstrated that Jesus is the servant that came with a capital S. He was the one who came to make a way for us. Amen? And, and, and so we get that in Mark. Luke shows us that Jesus came not just from Abraham through David, but he, Luke takes us all the way back to Adam in his genealogy. He lets us know, okay, the, the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, Jesus obviously came from Adam, and it demonstrates that Jesus is the perfect man. That seemed to be Luke's perspective. And, of course, John shows us Jesus came from heaven. And that's why when we look at it next week, 
We'll see why John 1, 1 opens the way it does. John wants to emphasize to us that Jesus came from heaven. He is God Almighty. Amen? And so we have these things. Um, I would say it's wrong to think that the Gospel of John completes the story of Jesus. I don't want to say it that way. It's the fourth and the last gospel uh, because John makes it clear that the story of Jesus is really never completed. He'll tell us at the end of this gospel that, hey, if, uh, if, if there would not be enough books, not enough ink, not enough paper to actually record everything that Jesus said and did. You couldn't even, all the books of the world couldn't even contain it. So John is not saying Matthew, Mark, and Luke did a good job, but now I need to come in and kind of give you the, the rest of it because there's still so much that Jesus said and did. Amen? But John certainly gives us this different perspective. Now, you may have heard the term synoptic gospels. How many have heard that term? Synoptic gospels. Okay, some of you have. Synoptic gospels, the word synoptic just simply means see together. See together. And the synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're known as that because they present Jesus' life in pretty much the same format. It's, it's pretty much the same from the beginning to the end of his ministry. The first three gospels focus more on what Jesus, listen now, taught and did. Matthew, Mark, and Luke emphasize what Jesus taught and the things that he did. But John focuses more on who Jesus is. And this is why this gospel is so powerful and is a wonderful balance to the synoptics, to the first three. Because John's, John has a purpose. And his purpose is to let everyone know exactly who Jesus is. Now, here's a little bit of background that you may not be aware of. Again, according to several different ancient sources, John, at this point, as he writes this, was an elderly man and he was living in Ephesus when the church leaders in Asia were prompted to ask him to write this gospel. And there was a purpose for it. And the Holy Spirit clearly confirmed this and had John write this gospel. And the reason was there was a heresy in the early church, even in the first century church. And John's gospel was written to refute or to argue against this dangerous heresy. It had started up among the believers, and it was about basically the nature and the person of Jesus Christ. The people who followed this faulty teaching were led by a very persuasive man who was probably a Jew, and his name was Serenthus. Serenthus. And he lived again at the end of the first century along with John. This is our understanding. This man was possibly born in Egypt, but he was reared by a Jew, and he became the leader of a Christian offshoot group that had, and I know we're giving a lot of stuff here, but you need to know this, he had Gnostic tendencies. Remember, we've used that word when we looked at 1 John. Gnosticism was a, was a belief and a teaching in the early church that was false. It taught that... Uh, Matter, M-A-T-T-E-R, everything that we see around us that God created in the physical, that doesn't really, it's not important. It's stuff that is evil. It's inherently evil. It's not really anything that can be redeemed. God is interested with our heart, with our soul. Those things can be redeemed, but don't worry about your physical body. Don't worry about what you might do with your physical body. God doesn't really care about any of that. That's just, I mean, very surface level, basic stuff. But this was the concept of Gnosticism. Uh, this man, um, Serentis, apparently believed that the world was created not by God, but by a lesser being called the Demiurge, or, may, or possibly by angels, one of whom gave the law to the Jews. He also taught that Jesus was an ordinary man. Re, you know, going over stuff we covered in 1 John, but in case you didn't hear that. He taught that Jesus was an ordinary man and that the Christ spirit, that the spirit of the Messiah came upon him at his baptism. So Jesus was an ordinary human being like you and I, but when he was baptized, the, the Christ spirit, that delivering messianic spirit, came on Jesus and stayed on him until the crucifixion. And then, of course, he died as a human being and the Spirit left him. Now, you and I already, I see these, and I'm glad I'm seeing them. I'm seeing a lot of heads shaking no. And it's good that you're shaking your head no, because this is false. 
This is a terrible, horrible, false teaching. And so um, uh, we, we recognize and see, as we go through the Gospel of John, you're going to see why John has to begin to emphasize the nature and the person of Jesus, because this heresy is running through some portions of the early church, and it's causing believers to wonder, well, what is it about Jesus? Because these are people that are living 40, 50 years after Jesus walked on the face of the earth, and they're questioning, okay, who is really Jesus? John says one thing, this other guy says another, and the, folks, as just a quick point here, this is why correct doctrine is important. Amen. Amen. Ye, many, many years ago, uh, the previous owner of TBN, um, I don't think he's still the owner, maybe I'm wrong on that, but he, he, made a, he made a statement about doctrine, and basically he was trying to encourage an ecumenical um, movement in the church where, hey, it doesn't matter if you're Roman Catholic, doesn't matter if you're Protestant, doesn't matter this or that. Let's all come together and not worry about doctrine. That's just, that's not important at all. Well, that statement is, I have a word for that statement. Baloney. It is important. And again, there's great evidence in the first couple of centuries of the church, that John wrote this gospel, of course, inspired by the Holy Spirit, but with a purpose to defend the nature and who and the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. That he was not just a man, but that he, is, that he is God Almighty. And that's why we started in John chapter 20 and verse 31. The purpose of the book is given to us in that last verse of John chapter 20. These things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, present tense by the way, you may have life in his name. Now, there's two Greek tenses um, for this word that's translated believe here in John chapter 20 and verse 31. Uh, I don't want to bore you with this, but there's two ways to, to look at this and to understand it. John might be saying that you may begin believing. I'm writing this to you so that if it's your first time reading about Jesus, you might begin to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. But there's another way to read it as well. He may be saying, I'm writing this to you so that you may continue to believe. Because it's actually written in the present tense, and this is why I think most of our translations say believing. It's not just that you did believe, but are you believing? Because it's only as we are believing that we have life in and through his name. Amen? Amen. And so John says, um, uh, I, I'm writing this to you so that you will continue to believe. So this is what I'm saying. Some people say, well, John's gospel is written to unbelievers primarily. And others would say, no, I think this gospel, as opposed to the first three, Actually, might, the purpose really might have been written to believers so that they would continue to believe and not get um, tripped up by the false doctrine of the Gnostics and others during that time. Personally, I lean towards this view because John often uses present tense, keep believing. Keep, you know, all these type of things, there's a present tense to the way that John writes these things. And so I think he maybe does have not only unbelievers, but believers in mind when he writes this gospel as a defense against the false doctrine of Gnosticism and any others that would come and try and, you know, mess with the deity of Jesus Christ, try and tear it down, try and take it apart. So very important that we get this. All right. Now, there's a number, a number that comes up in John's gospel again and again. The number is seven. All right, seven is a number of completion. It's a number of perfection. And we're going to see that in this Gospel of John, he, he focuses on seven primary signs that Jesus performed, miracles that Jesus performed to show that he is the Messiah, that he is God in human flesh. John is going to give us seven primary signs. Not only that, but John is going to give us seven primary teachings of Jesus that demonstrate who he is. And then on top of that, we have something that some of you may be aware of. 
There are going to be seven instances that John records for us where Jesus uses the phrase, two words, from the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, when Moses was in the wilderness and God said, I want you to go, you're going to be the one that's going to, I'm going to work through you to set my people free. And Moses said, remember to God, I can't do this. These people, what if they ask me, which God sent you? Who, what's the name of the God that sent you to come and deliver us uh, from Egyptian bondage? And remember what God said to him? What are you supposed to tell him? I am that I am is the one that sent you. So that phrase, I am, is very important in the Old Testament. It denotes deity. In the Gospel of John, seven times, Jesus is going to say, I am. And there's a purpose in that. There's a reason in that. The first one we're going to encounter is in John chapter 6 and verse 35. I'll just give the one to you. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Of life, And it's not just, trust me, it's not just in there as a, well, that's just the way he said it. No, there is a purpose to it, and as we go through the Gospel of John, you will see that. So again, there are seven primary signs, there are seven t primary teachings, and there are seven I am statements from Jesus. All of these are important in the Gospel of John, seven being that number of completion or perfection that we see throughout the Scriptures. By the way, seven comes up a lot in the Revelation as well, which John also wrote. All right, now finally, there are eight major topics that characterize John's gospel. And again, um, I'm going to give these to you. Donald Stamps in his uh, Full Life Study Bible or Fire Bible has this as well, and these are, are spot on correct. All right, eight major topics that characterize John's gospel. Number one, it focuses on the deity of Jesus as the Son of God. From the introduction, which openly declares the glory of the one and only who came from the Father in First John or in John chapter one and verse fourteen, all the way to the conclusion where Thomas makes the confession, "My Lord and my God." In John twenty and verse twenty-eight, Jesus is clearly presented as God the Son, the Word come in the flesh. So we stop right here. John's gospel is important to us. Because it states emphatically, without any question whatsoever, that Jesus is, was, and will always be God. Amen. John's gospel, just the, the, it hits this on the head again and again and again. And this is why we believe that the Holy Spirit prompted John to write this so that the Gnostic heresy could not be carried out any further. John wants people to know. From not just from his birth, but we'll see in John 1, 1, from the beginning of time, Jesus is God. He is not a created being. Mormonism, for instance, and this is why Christians and Mormons cannot, there can be no real fellowship together. I, I just feel to say this to you, the Mormon church in particular, probably more so than Jehovah's Witnesses, those are two of the big cults um, uh, around the world today, and a cult, and a cult meaning... They claim, the man, they claim the mantle of Christianity, but they are not. The Mormon church has, for the last 20 to 30 years, made a strong push to be perceived as mainstream. We're really Christians, just like you guys are. Don't call us Mormons. We are the church of the, of, of the Latter-day Saints, right? And, and so we're, we're Christians just like you guys are. It's been big marketing a lot that's been done to try and, and create this perception. But the problem is, is that the Mormon church and Joseph Smith teach something entirely different about the nature and the person of Jesus Christ. Don't have time to go into all of the details, but they say that Jesus was a created being. And that he and Satan, who we know as Satan, are spirit brothers. There's a lot into this uh, that we could go into that I don't want to, but I just want to simply say to you, John's gospel is emphatic about the nature of Jesus, and it's important. We, we can't just say, well, I believe he's God. Okay, you don't believe he's God. That's not that big a deal. It is a big deal. It is the biggest of the biggest deals. If he's not God, then he cannot die for our sins. He cannot walk this, this life um, for 33 plus years perfect and innocent and clean. He cannot die on Calvary as the clean, the perfect Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Amen. So John's emphasis on 
who Jesus is, that he is God Almighty, cannot be understated or swept under the rug uh, so that we can have, you know, well, it's okay, now we have a bigger tent. Everybody's about bigger tents. You can't have a bigger tent when it comes to who Jesus is. This is non-negotiable. Amen? Can I get an amen? amen. He, is, he is God Almighty, okay? So that's the first topic that John deals with, the deity of Jesus Christ. Number two, the word believe comes up in John's gospel 98 times. And it means to receive or accept by faith the fact that Jesus Christ is God's son. We'll see this in John chapter 1, and it will continue on throughout his gospel. But true biblical faith is not simply a matter of mental belief or recognition. It is a heartfelt response of active trust by which a person surrenders control of his or her life to Jesus Christ and continues to follow God's purposes. This results in an ongoing commitment of a person's life to him. So in John's gospel, believe has a continuing present tense nature to it. It's not just, did you believe with your mind 30 years ago? Oh yeah, 30 years ago I believed in Jesus and I asked him into my heart. I'm doing my own thing now, but I've still got it up here. I've got Jesus in, in my back pocket, in my hip pocket, and yeah, I believe in Jesus. So I'm a Christian. Yeah, We're going to see in John's gospel that that's not what faith is. That's not what belief is. This type of believing continues on. So I've made many a trip in airplanes. Started when I was probably only four or five years old. At four or five years of age, I had no idea how an airplane works. Actually, I know this is going to shock you all, but truth be told, even today, I don't really know how they work. <laughs> um, but, you know, when I was young, I'm just told, you know, my mom and or my dad, get on the plane. It's going to take you from here to there going to take you from one state to another. I had no real concept of mileage and how far and all those kind of things. But I get on the plane and, yeah, okay, the plane's going to take me. I believe that. If I didn't believe it, then I'd be a kid running around, screaming, yelling, give me a parachute, whatever, I, you know, all this kind of stuff. I believed. Now, can you imagine if I get to the point today where suddenly I decide you know what, because I don't understand airplanes, I, I really don't believe that they take you from point A to point B. I don't understand it, but I think there's some kind of deep, dark conspiracy that every time we see a plane go up into the sky, it never actually lands. It crashes somewhere. Something happens to it. It gets put into a time warp. I don't know, but I no longer believe in airplanes. I don't believe they do the job that we say. Now, this is different than if some of you are like, no, I'm not getting on an airplane. Jesus said, lo, am I with you always, pastor? I take that seriously. Okay, well, that's different. That's not what I'm talking about. But can you imagine going from at one time, I believed, but now all of a sudden, I'm not going to get on the airplane because I really don't trust these things anymore. Well, then I no longer believe. It's not good enough that I did believe at one time in the past. Do I believe right now? Do I continue to believe? And so we're going to see in John's gospel that this word believe will come up a bunch and that the point of it is that we keep on believing. And can I just share with you, this is all that Satan is really getting at in terms of Christians. All he wants you to do is stop believing. And if he can create a doctrine or a mindset whereby you begin to think all that matters is that I believed way back then, and I got my decision card and, you know, whatever else I can show you when I was water baptized. I don't really believe now, but that's okay. I believed back then. If Satan can get you to buy into that and that you, that's okay, that's fine. Don't worry about believing in the here and now. Well, he's, he's done his work. He has stolen your faith. Our faith has to be active. It has to be current. We have to continue. When someone loses out on their faith, they're, they're backsliding. They're moving away from God. So John's gospel is given to us, I believe, again, primarily to believers, written so that we would keep on believing. I know that sounds simple, but it is important. Are you still believing today? Are you still walking with him and trusting in him? And you say, of course I am. Stay away from so much of the news and so much of the, the academia of the world today because they will hammer away and hammer away. And I was just listening to a brother um, 
yesterday who was, was, had a discussion going on online, and he said that many years ago, as a Christian, he was studying for a PhD, and when you have to do that, he says you, you sometimes are referred to and you have to study things that are, are not strong, you know, solid biblical things. You're in academia, and a lot of academia doesn't believe in the miracles of Jesus. They don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. But when you're studying, you have to sometimes put yourself in And he said, there came a point where I had to set that stuff aside because it was affecting my faith. And I just couldn't listen to it anymore. Folk, be very careful what and who you listen to and what you allow to creep into your mind and into your heart because it can affect your belief. Keep on believing is a part of John's gospel. Another thing, number three, this is another topic in John's gospel, eternal life. And eternal life does not simply refer to endless existence. We get it all wrong and we think, we think eternal life refers to a duration of time alone. And this is why people come up and they say, well, if I was saved, I have eternal, everlasting life. It will stay forever, so I'm good to go. What I did 30 years ago. Eternal life is not really defined that way in the scriptures. Eternal life is defined as Jesus Christ. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. Eternal life is not so much about a duration of time as it is a quality of existence. We have God's life. That's what eternal life is. It's God's life in and through Jesus Christ. Now, will we live forever? Absolutely. But get ready for this in case you didn't think about this or know this. Every human soul, every soul that is created by God that, that comes into this earth is already an eternal being. It will, that soul will live forever. So eternal life means more than just a duration of time. Because everyone, every soul is going to live forever. The key to eternal life, as the Bible describes it, what we want is the life of God, which means we will be in God's presence forever. We are God's children forever. We are with him forever. Because there is another destination that goes on forever and ever and ever. Hell, the lake of fire, goes on forever and ever and ever. Do you hear me? So John will talk about eternal life and what that means. That we are changed, that we are living with the Lord, and there's a transformation that takes place in our life, and there's an ongoing relationship with God that comes again through that active faith in Him. This relationship, of course, frees us from the slavery to sin and Satan, and it gives us constant access to God and the life that He has planned out for us. That is eternal life, and that life is found in the Son. He who believes, he who believes shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And even in that scripture, John 3, 16, that we all know, the believe there is not past tense, it's present tense. He who is believing, he who continues to believe. So this is a part of John's gospel. All right, number four, personal encounters with Jesus are presented throughout the gospel. At least, I think, a minimum of 27 or so personal encounters between one individual and Jesus. John wants us to know that, yes, Jesus ministered to the masses. He spoke to the masses. We, are, we all assembled together. You know, we're a group of people. But also, there's a personal encounter with the Lord. We don't get saved in masses as in, if I'm a part of Berean Assembly and I'm in that church service today... And God does not, wow, all, I'm right, I'm going to ride the coattails of Pastor Gary or Sister Carolyn or whoever else. That's, I'm, no, that's, no, you must have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. I heard years ago a, a good statement that I've always carried with me, which is God has no grandchildren. God only has children, sons and daughters, you and I individually. And Jesus, we will see there are multiple individual encounters with people and Jesus Christ in John's gospel. And that's a good thing. Amen? Amen? It's a very good thing. Number five, another topic. The work of the Holy Spirit enables Jesus' followers to experience Jesus' life and power in an ongoing way even after Jesus' death and resurrection. And we'll see this as we get towards the end of the gospel of John. We will see that Jesus will make this point that although he goes back to heaven... 
He does not leave us as orphans. He does not leave us alone. But he gives to us his Holy Spirit that we might continue to have fellowship with God. Amen? Amen. And so that will be an important point that we'll get to towards the end of John's Gospel. Number six, it focuses on the topic of truth. This is another key word that will come up. It focuses on truth. Jesus is the truth. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. God's word is truth. God's truth sets people free, makes them clean, and is the exact opposite of Satan's character and activity. We're going to see that in John's gospel. Satan is a liar. He's the father of lies. He's always been a liar. But Jesus is truth. Amen? Amen. And he who has the Son has that truth. He who has the Son is free indeed. Amen? And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We'll see this again and again and again, and we'll see the contrast between the, the kingdom of darkness, Satan's kingdom, which is filled with lies, and the kingdom of God, which is filled with truth. Aren't you glad that we know and have the truth? Amen. Folks, we live in a day and age where almost everything is questioned. Almost everything all around us is questioned. And I'll tell you, Satan, you know, people say, do you believe in conspiracies? Well, I believe in the one great conspiracy, which is Satan is looking to trip everyone up and to deceive everyone and take everyone to hell that he can, and he will do whatever he can to do that. We live in a world now where we're, everyone is just like, is that really true? Is that really true? Is that really? And, and, and we have all this. Hallelujah. When it comes to our spiritual life, when it comes to our relationship with God, it is rock solid. We have the truth. The truth is contained here. It is. The truth is the word of God. Jesus is the truth. His spirit is the spirit of truth. I am so glad that this is one thing. We have a firm foundation as we know his word. But you get away from his word and get into other stuff, and all of a sudden you're on very, very iffy ground. It's no longer solid ground. So truth is important. Okay, two more things. Number seven, the number seven. <laughs> so the seventh point is that the number seven is a key number found in the Gospels. We've already talked about that. There are seven signs, seven uh, teachings or discourses, and the seven I am claims of Jesus. And all of these just simply go back and testify to who Jesus is. So John says, I'm going to give you these sets of seven, and they're all going to do the same thing. They have one purpose, and that is to show you exactly who Jesus is so that there can be no doubt whatsoever. No doubt whatsoever. Jesus is the Messiah. Folks, he is. He is God Almighty. He and he alone has come, and he has paid the price, and he is headed back to heaven now, but he's coming back again one day. We're going to get to that. Boy, that's going to be some, if, if the Lord tarries, we get to John 14. Woo! Boy, there's going to be some camp meeting when we get to that. Jesus is coming back, folks. We have it on solid, firm foundation. And then the last thing, number eight, there are other key words and concepts in John, and we give some of these to you. Light, the word light is used quite often. Word is used a lot. Flesh is used. Love is used. Witness is used. No, the word no, K-N-O-W. Uh, darkness is used. And the word world. These are words that come up in John's gospel again and again and again. And I don't know about you, but I'm excited. A lot of times when someone is first saved, one of the places we encourage people to go to is get into the gospel of John. It'll tell you who John is. I mean, if, you, if you're a new believer, admittedly, as you read through it the first time, you're going to be like, wow, what is that? You know, it, there's some parts of it that are, you know, kind of difficult to understand at first without having the context of the rest of the Bible. That's understood. But John's gospel tells us who Jesus is. He loves us. He cares for us. He's the shepherd of our souls. He is the savior of the world. He is king of kings and lord of lords. John's gospel is so wonderful at telling us who Jesus is. And I'm excited about getting into it and being reminded and being strengthened. You say, Pastor, I know all this. Trust me, you need to be strengthened. Do not underestimate. Listen to me. Do not underestimate the effects of the world all around us. We have people that are falling away from the Lord at record pace. So it's serious, and I just say that to you to encourage you, be here for these, for these meetings. 
be here and hear about the gospel of John and who Jesus Christ is. It will strengthen you in your faith no matter where you are at in your walk with him. All right, I'm going to ask Brother Ivor if he would just come over to the piano. I like what one commentator said about the gospel of John. He said its stories are so simple that even a child will love them, but its statements are so profound that no philosopher can fathom them. And I like that. Another man kind of said it this way. He said, the, the gospel of John is simple enough for a child to wade into like a wading pool, and any child can enjoy it, but it's also deep enough for all the whales of the ocean to swim through and never get tired. That's the gospel of John. It's a powerful, powerful gospel. As we end, I just remind you of that 31st verse of John 20. Again, this is the purpose of the book. These things have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Jesus Christ is God Almighty, and he is life, and there is life in none other, and there is salvation in none other, only in Jesus Christ. We're going to partake of communion here in just a couple of minutes. We're going to fellowship with the Lord in, in that way. But I encourage you even right now, if, you're, if your life is not right with God, if you don't have a relationship with the Lord, if you do not have a conviction and an understanding that your sins have truly been forgiven and that your name is written in the book of life, meaning that you are God's son or daughter, if you don't have that today, the Bible is very clear. Believe. Believe him. Submit your life to him. We'll see that that's what John's gospel is all about. It's not like getting fire insurance. Oh, I better get my fire insurance so I don't go to hell. It's not that. It's more than that. It is literally surrendering your whole life to Jesus Christ. Oh, but then I'll miss out on all the things. I... No, you won't miss out on anything. You'll be, be granted more than you could ever imagine. There is no other life except the Christian life. I can promise you of that. Can I get a few amens on that? Amen. amen. So let's bow our heads and let's ask the Lord just to lead and to minister. Heavenly Father, we thank you. I pray that right now that you would just speak to every heart here. Lord, we've been reminded of the truth of your word, that Jesus, you are God. And Heavenly Father, you have worked through men like the Apostle John to write things down for us so that we can believe, even 2,000 years later, we can believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. We can believe that and we can continue on to believe that we might have life in his name. I pray today, if there's anyone here that is struggling with that, let today be the day of salvation for them. Let them just fall into the open arms of Jesus. It is not a blind leap of faith. Lord, we have your word that is rock solid and true. All the evidence in your word, archaeology backs it up. Every, I mean, constantly we have all of these proofs of your word. All of the prophecies contained in the Old Testament about the Messiah fulfilled in Jesus. An impossibility, something that could not be done through human means. So Lord, it's not a blind leap of faith, but I pray if there's anyone here that does not believe, I, play, I pray today would be the day that they would call on the name of Jesus so as to be saved even if they don't understand it all, even if they don't comprehend it all. We don't have to. We just have to believe. And I pray that today people would believe. And I pray for your church that we would continue to keep on believing and never turn to the right or to the left. Lord, we honor you. We praise you. And I'm believing you to speak to every heart here in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' name, amen.